Whether you operate one forklift or thousands, one location or hundreds, the new My Toyota customer portal can help you optimize your operation and material handling equipment. This one-stop, free-to-use platform is designed to help you take control of your information and make smarter decisions, all at the touch of a button. Register and access your data today at my.toyotaforklift.com. That's my.toyotaforklift.com. Hi, this is Jonathan Chang from Forward X, and you're listening to the New Warehouse Podcast. Today's safety tip is take the dull, dirty, and dangerous work out of your warehouse by improving and supplementing your workflows with flexible automation like mobile robots. With e-commerce off the charts, many small and growing warehouses are asking, how can I get ahead when my warehouse is barely keeping up? The answer is future-ready warehouse tech from Zebra Technologies. Warehouses can simplify and upgrade all processes, from automated inventory management to hands-free picking with Zebra's tailored, scalable mobile solutions. They're simple and intuitive. There's never been a better time to upgrade for success with Zebra. How can your warehouse get ahead? The answer's in black and white. Get the answers at zebra.com slash the answer. That's zebra.com slash the answer. Fulfillment demand continues to skyrocket and outpace available labor. To keep up, warehouse operators are turning to flexible fulfillment solutions like Six River Systems. Utilizing Six River Systems' award-winning combination of collaborative robots, artificial intelligence, and operational expertise will make your associates and wall-to-wall fulfillment workflow more efficient. No new infrastructure, no change to warehouse layout, easy to deploy and scale, easy to train and retain associates, all at half the cost of traditional automation. Want to take your fulfillment operation to the next level? Level? Go to www.sixriver.com to learn more. That's www.sixriver.com to learn more. The New Warehouse Podcast, hosted by Kevin Lawton, is your source for insights and ideas from the distribution, transportation, and logistics industry. A new episode every Monday morning brings you the latest from industry experts and thought leaders. And now, here's Kevin. Hey, it's Kevin Lawn with the New Warehouse Podcast, bringing you a new episode today. On today's episode, I will be joined by Jonathan Chang, who is all the way over in China and technically in the future, too. There, I'm recording this at 9 p.m. the day before. He's at 9 a.m. the next day. So maybe you give us some, some insight into what's going to happen tomorrow. So he is the overseas marketing director at Forward X, and Forward X is a China based. Uh, robotics company providing AMRs for the, the warehousing and logistics space. So he's going to talk to us about that. And he's also going to talk to us a little bit about what the robotics scene is like in China and some of the impacts of the pandemic and the market that Fordex is specifically addressing. So Jonathan, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to having a conversation with you. Definitely happy to get you on and, you know, happy that we can connect on uh, basically opposite ends uh, of the globe. Very cool, you know, that we're able to do <laughs> yeah. that, right? All right. So yeah. so why don't you give us a little bit of information about Forward X and uh, tell us about Forward X, you know, how, how did it come uh, to be founded? I think it, it was founded in 2016, so only a couple of years old. Um, so tell us a little bit about the company and, and what it is you guys do. Sure. So to be to be brief, I guess, so ForwardX is what I would consider to be a creative kind of technology company. Mm. And we're operating in the kind of robotics and AI spaces. So at the moment, our kind of core focus is on developing this kind of intelligent platform. And, and so since we were founded, we, we've developed what, what I would consider to be, you know, an AI empowered fleet management software okay. and a wide range of of what we call vision first AMRs or autonomous mobile robots. And so our kind of mission or our goal is to be able to combine these two parts to be able to automate, you know, the, the dangerous, the expensive, the, the labor intensive tasks in industrial environments. And so, yeah, you're right. We, we were founded in 2016 mm-hmm. um, by a guy called Nicholas Chi. And so he's, I guess he, you consider him to be kind of a robotics guy. So he, mm-hmm. 
you know, studied in, I believe it was integrated circuits, both for his bachelor's and master's. And then he, he won ABU's Robocon when he was in university too. And so when he got out of uni, he went straight into the kind of, you know, the software as a service idea. So he went into SAP mm-hmm. before joining Oracle. So he's kind of got that idea of the supply chain and understands kind of, you know, how those side of th- those sides of things work. <clears throat> and so basically, you know, through the platform that we create, he, he's trying to, to, to help us or he's trying to lead us towards solving problems for, for warehousing and manufacturing facilities. So at the moment, we've currently got, you know, over 15 different mobile robot models okay. and, and a very comprehensive software suite that enables our robots to be able to carry out, you know, a variety of tasks yeah. and enables our robots to be able to operate in and around people. So to be able to collaborate with people. And I'm sure, obviously, you know, I've listened to the show many times before. Yeah. You guys understand and your listeners will understand just the benefits of, of being able to to combine your robots with your people and not having to completely separate them from each other at all times. And so at the moment, we, we focus on, you know, all range of, of material handling tasks in, in those kinds of facilities. Mm-hmm. So, of course, we've got like the hot topic of order picking. Obviously, everyone's talking about how can we automate the picking process so we we have those kinds of solutions but we also have you know the the, the i guess the, the uglier not so pretty movements like the, you know the pallet movements for, for put away and these yeah. kind of long haul movements that you'll get in a warehouse and so we're, we're really just trying to to apply the technology that we've been able to build to to help companies you know stop worrying about these these movements and, and you know let them focus on the things that they should be focusing on yeah absolutely and i think that's a good thing and i think you know it's interesting uh, you mentioned the the other task i guess in the warehouse as the as the ugly ones right the ones uh that are maybe are not so not so sexy when it comes to bringing a, a solution because picking is like the big deal right how do we get more picks how do we pick exactly. more stuff, right so so i mean it, i think it's awesome that you guys are addressing you know the the in-between processes as well so that's really cool so i'm curious you know with the robotics and being based in china you know a lot of the robotics companies i've had on the show are based in stateside like especially in massachusetts there's a lot of robotics stuff going on for the supply chain arena in that area but what what is the robotics scene like like in china now like what what is it going on over there Sure. So it, it's actually like a really interesting place to look at as a whole. So, mm-hmm. you know, being able to look at kind of the, the scene in America, so the scene in Boston, the scene in on the West Coast, yeah. it's really interesting to be able to be here in, in, in China and just see what how it kind of contrasts. So to be perfectly honest with you, the robotic scene here is just really fast paced and exciting. Mm. So you've got like, obviously, you've got this huge demand, you know, first coming from overseas, and then now you've got it also coming from the domestic market, too. And so what you happen what happens is these these huge industries kind of pop up what we, what seems to be overnight when you kind of compare them to the growth that we typically see in, in developed countries. Yeah. So for example, we look at like the e-commerce industry here and you've got companies that essentially went from like zero to hero mm. in in a really short space of time. <clears throat> and so we we kind of you, you ask yourself how did these companies grow so quickly and how did they manage that that growth? when demand was kind of exploding. Mm -hmm. And so the key here is that companies here just move really, really, really quickly and they aren't afraid to invest. Okay. So, and I'm not, not to say that that's always a positive thing Mm -hmm. and and that, 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 that doesn't backfire sometimes, but it's truly something unique about, you know, about this place and about China generally. And I'm, I'm just speculating, but I imagine it's because there's a kind of belief here that the first person to the market is going to be the one to capitalize. Mm, So, Everybody here is really fast paced. So when you tie that into robotics, so you've got both the companies that are buying robotics and the companies that are producing robotics, Mm. they're equally as quick, you know, and equally as willing to invest. So you obviously hear about things like rising wages in China and an aging population, the growth of Mm e-commerce. So you hear about those things and then everyone starts to kind of scramble, you know, we need to get robots. And then right. you, you end up getting this huge interest in robots, particularly mobile robots from, you know, manufacturing, from warehousing, even from service industries. Mm. So kind of overnight, again, you've got 
you know, everyone from like these multinational companies to like small local factories, they're all testing out some kind of mobile robot. Yeah. So with that demand, you, you obviously see two things. You, you've got the first thing, which is that more and more robotics developers are going to pop up, right? There's more demand. There's going to be, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of companies founded in quick succession. Mm. But secondly, you also see that the more mature players in the robotics market, they'll start to expand, you know, to, to match all of the different demands that are coming, all of the different scenarios that are coming. So, so w where are we now? I guess you look and you see you've got this huge d demand and to match it, you've now got this kind of huge supply of, mm -hmm. of, of robots. But to really understand market, you need to understand also how they kind of operate. Right. So here in China, you've got this affinity for, I, I would consider you've got this affinity for having a lot to choose from, mm. right? So from having a large selection of goods at your fingertips. So you go into a restaurant here and you're going to get, you know, a book of, of different things that you can eat. And it, it's something that is relatively common across the, the culture here. Mm. And so <clears throat> you can see this actually with a lot of tech companies, right? So you can see like Oppo, the, the smartphone maker, they just surpassed Huawei as the biggest smartphone maker in China. Mm. And they've got 36 different phones, <laughs> wow. you know, you compare that to Apple, who's got what, maybe 20, 21 different, mm. different phones to sell at the moment. Mm. And, and this is, this is kind of a good way of understanding the, the, the Chinese supplying market. And so in, in the robotics industry, this is also mirrored. So you've got, you know, a very wide range of scenarios and applications and such a high volume of each one. And, and buyers want a really wide range of robots to choose from. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's funny, actually, I, I went to an exhibition, I think it was yeah last, maybe in the summer of last year, mm. and, you know, and, and it was the first time I had seen a lot of these, you know, a, a lot of companies. So it was the first time I'd seen a lot of mobile robot companies. I hadn't really heard of them. Mm. hadn't really seen their websites hadn't really seen any you know press from them at all yeah and yet i've seen you know i saw tons of them the next year comes around you know you go to a go to one today and and you'll see that they've got a 30 page catalog of products now wow so so they go from this kind of small maybe you know let's say 10 square meter mm -hmm. or, or 20 square meter booth to, to kind of this much larger booth with many products that, that have kind of seemingly come out of nowhere yeah so that, that's something that's really great about china is that you know things move so quickly here you know people aren't necessarily both on the buying and selling side they're not really worried too much about the risk of, of investing in new technologies mm. so that's the great thing the trouble is though when you combine that kind of speed that's required to get ahead here and you combine that with the affinity for a wide product range Sometimes what happens is products tend to be developed without, you know, a full picture of how they're going to be used or without a full picture of whether they really solve the problem. Right. So, so that, that's the kind of the Chinese market, you know, in a nutshell is that you've got these really quick, like, you know, developments that happen mm -hmm. and, and sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're really great. You get, you know, you get a lot of buyers and, and, and sellers that are doing a, like having a really, really great time of it. But you also have this kind of downside where, you know, there'll be this wide range of product products, whereas maybe only one or two of them actually sell. Mm -hmm. So I guess to, to, to contrast or compare how Forward X sits into that, you know, um, we're trying our best to be a hybrid of that kind of Chinese quick movement, okay. but that kind of Western style of thoughtfulness. And, and I guess that, that, that style of maybe taking a little bit more time, mm -hmm. Uh, and trying to really watch the market, understand the problem, see how people are you know, reacting to this problem, mm. and then to develop something that really fits and really solves that problem for sure, you know, 100%. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to hear about how the market is there. And I, I guess I didn't, didn't realize how quickly things move there like that so so it's very interesting i'm curious you know with the the quickness do you find that you know i mentioned earlier you know the kind of this robotics hub that's that's here in in massachusetts area it's very collaborative in a sense the companies kind of work together in a way and you know are doing things to help i guess like develop together do you mm -hmm. find that like in china like with the the quickness of the movement is it more 
competitive there in a sense and not so collaborative or or is it collaborative there i would say that it can be both Mm -hmm. so in most cases i I would say that it's just a very very competitive market okay and so in, in many cases you're moving so quickly that you're not necessarily you know paying attention to what other companies are doing you're not mm-hmm. necessarily planning you know that far ahead so for like for example with the the new mass robotics they just put out their kind of interoperability right standard right mm-hmm. and so that takes a lot of planning it takes a lot of you know thinking ahead it takes a lot of kind of ruminating on what the future of robotics will be mm-hmm. whereas you know in the, in the, the i guess the robotics community here you know, a lot of companies, they're still startups. They're, they're, they're yeah. really just trying to accomplish their, their goal now. They're trying to get to the, that next, you know, level of funding or they're trying to get to that next, you know, that next round of, of, of you know, series E or D or wherever they're trying to get to. They're not necessarily thinking so far ahead as to think about, you know, in the future when we have, you know, a warehouse full of different robots, how are they going to interact with each other? Mm. So, in many cases, it's very, very competitive. But in other cases, you can, you can find collaboration if you look for it. So there are companies here that collaborate with others. There are companies that, you know, are open to, to collaboration with each other. I just, I would guess it's just not such a common thing as you might see, you know, uh, in the States. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering about that since you said the, you know, the quickness to market, I mean, it kind of, I guess moving that quickly, it makes you feel like, you know, it is pretty competitive. So, so it's interesting to yeah. hear that. Yeah. On the contrast side. So, so now with, with forward X and, you know, we're talking about the, the Chinese market there and, and robotics within China, how does forward X now kind of fit into the global market? Sure. So, I mean, we see ourselves in, in quite a unique position mm-hmm. and that there's, a, I guess there's a few reasons why, and there's a few things that we see in the robotics market generally and the markets that robots are used in. And so I guess the first, the first big thing that we see is that the industries that robots are used in can have such a wide range of, of you know, different factors. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how they're set up, what kinds of products they're handling, what their goals, what goals, goals they're focused on you know, what problems or pain points they're suffering from. These can all, uh, there is a range, but they all range quite, you know, there's quite a variety of these different factors. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, what happens is you get some robotics companies that would prefer to dive very deeply into a single scenario or, you know, a single problem and focus themselves on on solving that that particular problem. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with that idea and there's, there's nothing, you know, wrong with with what those companies are doing and in fact a lot of those companies are doing extremely extremely well but the problem we see with that is that it limits the potential of of how effective your solution can be for the industry as a whole and so you know to to quote amazon i think i I guess we're trying to think a little bit bigger Mm. so we're, we're focusing on kind of how can we make the biggest difference and yeah e commerce is booming but we're not going to neglect the traditional B2B warehouses, mm. right? You know, they need to keep the shelves stocked. We, we can't neglect the manufacturing in, manufacturing industries that need some sort of flexible automation that can't keep up with, you know, changing product lines, changing everything all the time. And so for us, we're, we're really trying to, I guess, address a, a slightly wider market. And we understand that there's going to be problems with that. There's, we understand it's not going to be an easy road. But we believe that, you know, the technology, we're not doing justice to the technology if we can't apply it to where it actually makes a difference. And so I guess that's the first big thing that we see, uh, you know, that separates ourselves from from the rest of the industry. Secondly, I guess warehousing manufacturing industries haven't, you know, traditionally always been the quickest industries to adopt new technologies, right? You still got warehouses out there that are totally manual. And yet, there's been automation solutions yeah. around that around for yeah, you know, for fifty stuff odd on years. Paper and everything, exactly. yeah, crazy. Exactly, exactly, right. But over the last year, after the last last few years, we're starting to see, or in the future, we're starting to see this kind of breaking point, right? Mm-hmm. We're starting to see that new technologies are going to come through. Starting to see things like blockchain, even you know, co- coming into the warehouse. So, with that, we believe that these spaces are going to start to see these kind of big sci-fi movie like changes. Mm. But the trap here is that it, it, if you're a robotics developer, it's very easy to justify 
putting your chips onto maybe a slightly less advanced technology in order to solve the problem that exists right now. So to, in order to solve that problem that, you know, other companies have been trying to fix for a very long time. Mm. And so they do this without necessarily thinking about how that problem might change in the future. So you end up developing something that, you know, maybe has slightly higher requirements for use or needs a more controlled set of variables to, to function well. But, the, you know, it's, it's a little bit cheaper to make and it's easier to convince people to buy it, right? So an example here is, for example, like let's say a QR code based kind of goods to person technology, right? Mm -hmm. So it works very well in a specific circumstance. But are you willing to change every facility you've got to be able to fit that, that technology? You know, is it going to be a competitive advantage for you when the, the more advanced technologies become available at cheaper prices? Right. Mm -hmm. So I I, I, th I think you had maybe the, the, the CEO of um, Invia on here the other day, and he even right. said, you know, Amazon, yeah, they've, they've got 300,000 robots out, right? Mm -hmm. But they're only in 30% of their warehouses. Yeah. Right. It, it's, it, it's, you know, it's, it's a technology that has a lot of, backing it's got a lot of reputation though it's it, it's got a lot of case studies to to, to show you that it works well mm -hmm. but it is a slightly simpler technology it can't necessarily fit into any scenario it, it has higher requirements for use right mm -hmm. and so you, you know you look at a company like amazon for example and yeah. the amazon robotics division and they re recently published this post about all of the technologies they're working on right and so yeah they've got you know the a huge number of warehouses with kivas in them, mm -hmm. but they're also working, you know, and pumping resources into infrastructure free robots. Right. Like you, you saw in the videos they published, like an automated tugger. You saw the kind of the the robot from Canvas that when they mm -hmm. when they bought Canvas, you know, they're investing the technologies into these kind of infrastructure free technologies. And yes, in many cases they can be a little bit harder to figure out. Right, they're a little bit harder to, to 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 make sure they're working properly, but in the end, you know, I I think personally that they're going to be able to touch and they're going to be able to improve a much wider part of the market because you know you you put all of the requirements, all of those kind of controlled variables, kind of go to zero, mm. and now you can kind of copy and paste them and and put them wherever you want, doing whichever job you want. So th those are the kind of two things. So. First of all, you know, we're trying to address a slightly larger part of the market. And second of all, we're trying to develop this technology that is able to do that, you know, that is able to to kind of morph and, and, and change depending on the circumstances and still deliver you that kind of, you know, improvement that you'd, look, you'd get from, you know, those slightly more simple kind of controlled technologies. Right. We'll be back after a quick break. You hear a lot about supply chains these days, because if the past couple years have taught us anything, it's that an efficient, well-managed supply chain is absolutely critical to keeping businesses successful and consumers happy. I'm Will Haywood, and I host a podcast called All Business, No Boundaries, where we talk about supply chains, how they work, what happens when they don't, and the innovations that are redefining what's possible in the world of logistics. Join me for insightful interviews with thought leaders and industry experts. We discuss how optimizing supply chains can break down the barriers that are holding businesses back. That's All Business, No Boundaries by DHL Supply Chain. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I think it's really interesting, and, and you know, it's a really good point there too, as well. Especially, you know, pointing out, like you said, you know, even though Amazon is has all these robots, it's only in thirty percent of you know their distribution centers, and you know, I think it's it's an interesting thing because you know, so far, I mean, the robotic technology is, is advancing a lot, but kind of like what you were mentioning is it, it is somewhat rigid i know like for me you know i was shopping for some amrs to to use at a facility that i work out during the day and you know it's it, we learned some things there in the sense that like oh well you know it, it can't engage with the carts that we were using that were set up to work with order pickers and and pallet jacks in the traditional sense and the technology is just not there to kind of engage with it and being able to use that. So that was like interesting to see. And, it, you know, it's, it's interesting to see, I guess, like, 
you know, it seems like it's it's advancing so much, which it is, but there's also still a lot of that rigidness to it as well. Like you said, you know, there's specific requirements and higher level requirements that need to be met in order for these robots to be able to to function properly and do the things that they're they're designed to do. So the fact that you guys are, you know, trying to create that flexibility more with your solutions, I think is is really smart and really a, a great way to go about it because I think at some point, you know, just like you know, just like you're mentioning in in the China market, like, you know, how people are things are growing, so they're like, Oh, we need to get robots, we need to get robots. That's gonna become, you know, the global thing, I think, as well. And it's gonna get to that point where, you know, especially as, you know, I know here we deal with a lot of issues right now with just being able to get the labor that we need to fulfill orders and and deal with these e-commerce spikes that are have been coming from the pandemic and everything and now consumer behaviors change totally so you know at some point there's going to be that breaking point it's like we just gotta you know bite the bullet and get into automation and robotics more because you know we're just not able to get the people to come and and do the jobs we need them to do to fulfill these orders so you know with with the topic i guess of the pandemic there you know obviously global impact worldwide especially on the supply chain you know i think people that had no idea what supply chain was before now know what supply chain is because everybody was talking about it because they couldn't get stuff and now you know it's the supply chain yeah. the reason they can't get it you know i'm curious you know from your perspective and being in china you know how how did the pandemic really impact the supply chain space in china and how does it differ if it differed to other markets throughout the globe sure sure so i, I guess to, to preface this i will say that i've been in china throughout the pandemic so that kind of gives me a unique perspective right on the impacts here, mm. but to be honest with you, it probably gives me little to compare it to outside of China, other than the kind of, you know, the, the articles I've read about responses to COVID gotcha. and, you know, the anecdotes I've heard from my family outside of China. Yeah. So I guess at the beginning here, obviously the pandemic took a real toll. So I remember at the, at mm. the beginning, you know, you know, they were taking big hits to industrial production and GDP was, you know, going down, you know, relatively quickly when you compare to the, the years of growth that had been seen before. And so at the beginning, you know, obviously, for example, you, you look at Wuhan, which was, you know, completely shut down and it was a hub for, you know, transportation and logistics here, right. also a hub for a lot of high tech producers. So obviously th this complete shutdown of the economy in, in, in Wuhan, this obviously had a massive impact on other parts of the supply chain, other parts of China and led to these kind of really long delays and bottlenecks. Mm. When you when you looked at it on the ground, however, I guess at the at the beginning the government, you know, obviously put in in place these 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 COVID measures. You know, no need to go outside, no need to work. You know, basically shut down anything that you might want to go outside to see in the first place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you had no reason to go outside. You know, you had these kind of voluntary two week, I guess, quarantines at home. You know, you had, you know, people in community coming around to check to make sure that you're okay, making sure that you, you know, you, 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 are you wearing your mask and things like this, mm. but on, on the ground, you know, if you really did have to go outside or if you did have to go and get something from the shops, you know, we didn't see like toilet paper shortages, mm. <laughs> you know, we had, we had, the, it seemed like shops had what they needed to, to have. Yeah. I guess the, the big thing was that just shops were shut down for, mm. for, for, you know, quite a long time. So obviously with, with China being one of the key links in the kind of global value chain, right. the, the, any shutdowns here obviously had huge negative effects across the world. And, and it's, it's a shame that, you know, I, I'm not, not to say it's a shame that we have globalization, but it's a, sh a shame that, you know, how closely we're linked also has this negative effect, mm. you know, when, when one of us has, you know, has a large problem. So, I guess the, the unilateral ability here to be able to set and enforce measures to stop the spread of the pandemic really made a massive difference. So everything, to be honest with you, after that shutdown was, was everything was under control. People were back out at work. We were back out on the streets in maybe like March or April last year, just about the time that it started to really hit other countries. Yeah. And so I know in, in, in most other markets and getting back to business as usual mm. is not, 
was not and, and still is not easy. There's still a lot of com- countries that you know haven't come back out of lockdown, mm. going back into lockdown, these kinds of things. And they're, they're, they're still suffering from, you know, I guess, supply chain shortages. We're, we're trying to look deeper into the future and see, you know, how are things going to be effective, affected as, as time goes on. Right. And then here in China, obviously, that, you know, first, of, first off, it, it hit the economy here. But then as that kind of knock on effect happened to other countries, that that demand kind of that usually came back around and came back from outside of the country you know, that kind of dampened too. Mm. So it was, you know, it was this kind of doubled up effect of, you know, first the production here is all shut down. You know, people can't go into factories. People can't go, can't go into warehouses. Key links in the, you know, in the logistics and transportation networks here were completely shut down. Then when we came back out of it, we, we now have, you know, this kind of strange demand where domestic demand is really, really high. Everyone's going crazy because they can finally get back out of the house. Right. But the, the traditional demand that used to come from outside has kind of now died down, right? Or, or at least it's it's in a different place than it was before. Right. So it, it, it was an interesting place to be, and I can't compare it too much to, to other countries just because I haven't mm. actually been there. But I, I know that in terms of the response and the kind of bounce back of the supply chain, it seems to be it seems to have been quite quick. Mm. But what are, what are the lasting effects of it in terms of maybe from a political and economical standpoint, the effects on the supply chain here might be quite large going right. forward. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. I mean, to, to hear the perspective, you know, certainly yeah. because, you know, it was such a, I guess a key factor in everything happening and it's really where, you know, it kind of hit first. So, you know, and it's interesting too that you're saying that you're not seeing as much demand from the outside anymore, which which I was going to ask you about because I was curious. You know, as now, you know, things are starting to open back up and things are getting back to normal here in the U.S. At least, you know, I was curious. You know, are you guys experiencing like a spike in demand because now people are, you know, just like you said, like there you know, people are back out and now people are back out here. Now I was curious, like if companies are trying to, you know, get their supply back and bolstered up and stuff from the production facilities that are in, in China, but it sounds like that's not necessarily the case. Is that, is that true? I mean, so obviously to, to, to talk about it from a political, political point of view, mm-hmm. once the, the kind of demand maybe had died down or there was, let's say, some kind of political discourse about, reshoring and these kinds of things right. china kind of smartly moved there and shifted their focus away from their traditionally kind of very large markets started to look maybe closer to home mm. you know started to look to, to the apac region so i i can't i can't say that the demand has had a massive effect in terms of like shutting companies down now or, and, and things yeah. like that i would say that in terms of production everything here is you know back to normal it seems everything's kind of you know, firing on all, all cylinders. Uh, you know, if we look at the kind of like manufacturing indexes and everything, we're all usually back above fifty, and you know, we're we're producing, you know, similarly to how we were before the pandemic. Mm. But I mean, if if you look at that kind of where where is that demand coming from now? You know, where is where did we where did China want the demand to be coming from now? I mean, th- that that could be slightly different than it was before. Okay. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's really interesting to hear the perspective of, you know, what's happening there. And, you know, obviously from someone that's, that's been there through, through it all now, it sounds like. So, you know, definitely really interesting yeah. to hear all that and also, you know, hear about the, the robotics scene as well. So now, you know, kind of going back to the, the robotics side of things. So, you know, one thing that you guys are, are focused on at Forward X is addressing the medium-sized goods market, right? So we did, you know, we talked a little bit about the picking side of things and things like that. And, and a lot of robots and robotic companies are, are focused on more of like that e-commerce aspect, which is a lot of like small piece picking, right? So, mm-hmm. and then we look at, you know, AMRs and EGVs that are, you know, moving pallets, full pallets, things like that. But you guys are kind of addressing the, in between so i guess you know what my first question i guess about that is really you know when we look at 
classification of size, right? You know, mm-hmm. I guess, you know, small, medium, large when it comes to like a t-shirt makes sense, right? Yeah. But small, medium, large when it comes to, you know, goods and the distribution center and and moving them around and doing those types of things, you know, what? how does that classification kind of fall in? And what is the, the medium-sized range? How do you define medium-sized? Sure. So I guess when we talk about medium size, we're kind of mm-hmm. talking about the, the case picking side of things, right? So we're okay. talking about, it can be piece picking of kind of slightly larger goods, or it mm-hmm. can be, you know, case picking of, the, of those kind of smaller e-commerce goods that we're talking about. And so when we talk about those kinds of like medium sized goods, what, we, what, what I'm generally talking about is the things that are slightly heavier, you know, the things that can't necessarily be put onto, you know, a small cart, okay. the things that aren't necessarily very comfortable to pick up and carry around with you Mm. you know and and i think like you said before there's a lot of you know there's a lot of companies that are focused on the e-commerce market you know they're focused on these kind of narrow aisle fulfillment centers you know these these kind of these these companies that have have been thriving in the e-commerce market you know a lot of companies are focusing on them and and so we understand that e-commerce is booming and we understand that you know once the pandemic is over e-commerce will likely have you know, keep and retain the the share that it's taken from traditional retail. But we also know there's a huge part of the market, you know, I would say probably the majority of the market, in fact, that needs a solution that's not that, you know, you know, their warehouses don't necessarily look like these very narrow aisle right. warehouses with, you know, cardboard racks, right? <laughs> like it's, that's not how every warehouse is built. Yeah. And so we noticed that a lot of AMR companies just don't really focus on that side of things. You know, you have the companies that are moving pallets, you have the companies that are order picking small pieces, mm. but you've forgotten that kind of middle area. You know, how does something get from, you know, a full pallet to that piece, that piece pick that, right. that we need for e-commerce, you know, orders. And so, you know, when I talk about the underserved part of the market, you know, I'm, I'm usually talking about those kinds of case picking scenarios, you know, the, the picking of, of medium sized goods, like I say, you know, air conditioners, home electronics that aren't necessarily very easy or comfortable to put onto, you know, a small robot or, you know, a small, a small car. Mm. And so at Forward X, our kind of, our focus, our, our max L range of robots, they're specifically dedicated to automi- automating kind of pick to pallet workflows so the, the 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 workflows that traditionally would be carried out by a you know a pallet uh, you know like a, a manual pallet truck with a with a pallet you know, laid on the top of it mm. and so the idea is that w- combined with our fleet management software we can use these robots to reduce walking distance you know to increase picks per hour to make a picker's job safer just the, the same way robots do for e-commerce mm. But for that much wider range of scenarios, you know, so you've got you've got all of these traditional B two B kinds of warehouses where you know you're fulfilling to a to a retail store or maybe you're you know distributing to other warehouses, and, and they need solutions too. They they need something that can help them. You know, I'd say picking case you know, case picking and medium sized goods picking if, on, on for the worker on the worker side of things is more you know laborious it's made so it's more difficult for your body it's, it's something that's a little bit more dangerous for you especially if the ergonomics aren't right and so i guess with the, with the solution we're trying to we we try to break down first of all kind of where the action is happening in the warehouse so our fleet manager looks at you know where is that action happening and then it uses you know the algorithms to 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 use that knowledge to segment that warehouse, you know, to, to segment the orders and then to assign those tasks across robots and people. So what the software will do, it will, it will basically keep each picker in a specific zone. Obviously mm. everyone's familiar with the kind of zone based picking. Right. And it of course allows the AMRs to travel throughout those zones. So that the AMRs are doing the bulk of the movement. And, and when you're talking about, you know, case picking or, you know, a heavy, load of goods mm. this this makes a big difference both to speed and to safety right and so with our software we're actually able to you know decide based on the the size of the zone and the work being done in the zone we can we can decide how the robots should interact with people you know so i think you know there's been a relatively large argument between i guess locus and six rivers kind of 
informally about which one is better, right? The idea of mm. following the robot or do we just walk around and in kind of this kind of cluster of, of, pick, of robots and pickers. Mm -hmm. And so we actually have a combination of both. Mm. So we like to use what we call kind of hive mode where robots and people are directed by the software, but move independently. Okay. And we also employ pilot mode in other zones where people will follow the robots through the zone and they're guided through the picks. Mm. So our software is really unique in the idea that it can, you know, it, it does this, the similar kinds of things in terms of creating zones and, and, and batching orders and things like this, but it can also decide, decide based off of that zone, what, what's the best way of this person carrying out the pick? Do we need them to be following someone through, you know, do, or following the robot through, or can they be moving independently? Is it easy enough for that to happen? And so, at the moment, you know, there aren't any providers that are really providing this kind of picking solution for the medium sized goods, like case picking scenarios. So, you know, you, you've got companies that develop robots that are pallet movers, you know, they're big enough to be able to, to carry the, the loads that we're talking about, but they don't necessarily offer the software capability for those to be able to be used for picking, mm -hmm. you know, in, 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 let's say in a, a complex picking scenario. So here in china at least this is you know this is one of our most popular solutions and we've deployed it in a, you know a very large number of facilities here in china with e-commerce companies for example we're, we're working with i i won't i can't say the name but they're a very very large e-commerce company here and at the moment we're working with them in some of their kind of e-commerce warehouses to move things like microwaves that people are ordering online mm. and to move things like air conditioners that people are ordering you know during like for example we just had or or tomorrow we will have Liu Yaoba, which is six one eight, which is a like a large e commerce holiday here. Okay. So there's there's gonna be tons of this kind of demand. And so right now we're using our robots, you know, to help out this this, you know, huge e commerce giant mm. to move these kind of bigger goods. When people order something slightly larger on the internet, you know, how are they gonna how are they gonna get it to your house? All right. And, and it's something that, you know, we see a lot of companies asking for, actually, you know, they start to realize once it's possible, you know, we don't need to be using, you know, an automated forklift for everything. Mm. We don't need to be using, you know, people and pulling around manual pallet trucks every day. But there are better solutions to this, to this work. And so once people realize that we start to get more and more inquiries. And now, in fact, you know, people are moving and they're looking at this kind of the, the max L range and they're seeing videos that we have on the internet and they're thinking, Oh wow. Okay. Wait, you know, picking robots are not just these, these small robots with a screen, mm. you know, they, we can also use these kind of larger industrial looking robots and they're, you know, they, they use that smart brain that, you know, the smaller robots use that they, they, they use that system, that, that fleet management software in the same way that the smaller robots do to be able to help you and help, you know, a lot of warehouses get the work that they thought previously not automatable, help them get it done. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, I mean, it's really interesting. I mean, addressing this, this need in the market that's kind of been, I don't know, I guess looked, looked around or maybe not wanted to be addressed. As like we said, you know, the picking is like the, the piece picking and stuff is like such a spotlight on that. But yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. And, it, you know, I think it's, you know, you had a really good point in there about, you know, it also being addressing the this safety concern, right? Because even if you're, you know, even if you're picking, you know, using a robot of some nature, like collaborative robot, you're still touching those pieces at some point, right? You get, mm -hmm. have to get them to the robot. So, so being able to, I guess, utilize your robots for these, these little kind of heavier, heavier goods, and have less touching of the heavier things for the employees and the workers, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense to be able to, to save them from, from doing that as much as possible and, and transporting those types of things around. So really interesting stuff. I mean, it, it, it's interesting to hear, you know, about the, the, the China market and how things are going there. And then also what you guys are doing and, and trying to develop these different solutions to, to fill these kind of, I guess, holes or, or gaps in the industry. So you guys recently had a round of funding and, you know, so I'm curious, you know, along with that 
funding news and you know looking into the the future for forward x i guess looking looking forward for forward x right <laughs> um you know what uh what's what's in the future for you guys what you know you talked about kind of the you know the the number of products is, is, that you have to offer is, is a big deal in china but you guys are also trying not to move that fast as well to make sure that your products are right. solid so i mean what is it what does the future look like and is it a bunch of other products or what how are you guys looking to scale and i guess use that funding now to to springboard into the next phase sure so yeah so like you said we're we're really happy to be able to kind of raise this or or close out our series b round mm -hmm. and so we're, we're kind of excited to push forward with that with that vision that we've got to be able to help those companies. So I guess it, it breaks down to kind of a threefold, you know, th three things that we're really looking for in, in terms of our intention with this new finance thing. Mm -hmm. So I guess the first thing that we, you know, we're looking at is expansion into new markets. Okay. So with the idea we have is that, you know, the problems that we see in the warehouse, for example, they're not really specific to one country you know they're problems that you you're going to see in in many many different countries mm. and the drivers might be slightly different in terms of kind of labor availability or wage wage rises and things like that that those those drivers might be slightly different mm. but you do see this demand coming from almost every country you can think of for you know automation for flexible automation in the warehouse, right? You, you, we get inquiries from Brazil, we get in, inquiries from India, we get inquiries from, you know, Mexico, all over the world, we, we, they, they, these problems are observed mm -hmm. all over the world, right? And so since we've started, we've also had a lot of kind of, I guess, the, the larger kind of multinational companies that we've got on board, we, we've always been having them asking us, you know, when are we going to be available here and there and everywhere? Yeah. And so with this financing, we're, we're hoping that we can really, you know, start to touch the new markets and, and start to help out our current partners and our, our future partners, you know, across the world in their other operations. Mm -hmm. and, and so we actually just established our, our Japan branch okay. and we'll be opening our office in Tokyo very, very shortly. Other than that, we obviously expanded into the US last year uh, in January. Mm -hmm. But obviously, with the, with the timing of the pandemic, it was it was a bit of a challenge to plant our flag yeah. on the American market. So, with this financing, really hoping to to reinforce our U.S. operations too, and really start to make more of a difference in the U.S. Obviously, being such a a massive market and and, and having such a an already built up you know a robotics industry. And and so the second thing on top of that is we're obviously going to continue our kind of aggressive R and D plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever people talk about what they're going to do with finance and they always talk about, let's develop new products, let's make our current products better, et cetera, et cetera. But what they, I guess, neglect to think about is that you should be using a lot of your financing also to listen to the market and to really understand what the market wants first before you start to develop these, these, these new products and, and, right. and make improvements to your current products that might not necessarily be a great thing. They might not necessarily be what the market wants. And so we've really been, you know, expanding our kind of the, the research and strategic part of the company here mm. to really be able to understand better what do people want? What, what is going to fix the problem? You know, what is the real issue here? And so along with that, you know, when we, when we come to good conclusions, when we come to conclusions that are solid and that are, are robust, then, then yes, we will you know, improve or upgrade our current products. And we will probably add new products too. And, and not just on the hardware side, we're likely going to try to add to our software suite to be able to make things kind of maybe slightly easier or, or slightly better for, for companies in terms of setting up the solution themselves, right. you know, making that solution easier to use, making it easier to not just use as a, as a, as a physical tool, but also to use as a, as a strategic tool, you know, so talking about kind of data visualization and, and those kinds of tools that we already have, but, you know, there's always more that we can be doing on that side of things too. And so we've got, you know, some of the top kind of robotics and, and AI scientists working for us. And so we want to really invest in their ideas and, and continue to kind of push the, 
the envelope with our technology. And then I guess lastly, the third mm-hmm. thing that we're going to do, and, and this kind of, if you look at the funding round that we're in now, the idea here is that we need to I- accelerate commercialization, right? So we, we need our products to really penetrate the, the markets that we're in more. So we're going to look into the domestic market and then we're going to expand our operations and kind of revenue teams. Mm-hmm. We're going to open regional offices. We'll, we'll partner with like, like-minded you know, corporations and hopefully we'll be able to deliver our solutions to a larger part of the market here. Uh, and so, like I said before, w- with our attitude of, of addressing as many, you know, you know, addressing any scenario where this technology can be the best, you know, can, can, is the, the best option. Mm. With that attitude, you obviously have a very large addressable market, right? And so, for us, the goal is to really become, a, you know, a major player for all of the kinds of workflows, for all of the the tasks that we want to automate, or that we want to help companies automate. So, yeah, the, the, those are the three kind of keys here. We'll, we'll try to focus on those ones. Mm-hmm. And so far, you know, obviously the financing happened a couple of months ago, and so far, you know what I've seen here has been amazing, and, and we we're moving really quickly again, but again in a, in a really thoughtful way. And so we're doing. I, I feel like we're doing things the right way, and we're getting that nice hybrid of that kind of agile, fast paced movement, mm-hmm. while also being kind of you know ruminating and, and thinking things through. You know, making sure that we 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 get on the right track and making sure that we you know steer the ship in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I mean, exciting stuff definitely to, to come as well. And, you know, it's, it's great that you guys are expanding into other markets and, you know, especially Japan and, and trying to, I guess now that things are getting back to normal a little bit, you know, like you said, the timing, uh, the new normal, <laughs> yeah, the timing was, was not so good coming into the U S but now, you know, I think that, you know, there is that demand here and, you know, especially we talk about, you know, the, the longer lasting impacts, I guess, from the pandemic and things is certainly the consumer behavior has, has changed and more people are used to now utilizing e-commerce and order things online. So I think that, you know, robotics is, it's inevitable to be widely adopted throughout the, the globe, really. So, so it'd be exciting to see, you know, how you guys progress and how things continue to advance for you as well and how, how you guys continue to grow and and move forward of course right so yeah yeah so <laughs> so jonathan i want i want to <laughs> thank you so much for coming on the show and, and talking to me how can people find out more information about forward x sure so if you go to our website at www.forwardx.com mm-hmm. uh, you'll be able to see you know everything that i'm talking about in terms of the products that we've got the you know the industries and solutions that we offer mm-hmm. as well as the the more technical things you can see a little bit more about our technology and you know you can learn more about us and the mission that we're on at the moment other than that you can look out for us if you're in america obviously you can look out for us you know on the west coast and you can look out for you know some more of the the kind of interesting partnerships that we have lined up for the future yeah. so you know fingers crossed you'll see us you know in a warehouse soon <laughs> All right. Sounds good. And we'll put all that info on the new warehouse.com as well. So Jonathan, thank you once again for your time today. You've been listening to the new warehouse podcast with Kevin Lawton. Subscribe and check us out online at the new warehouse.com. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you want more content from the new warehouse, check out our new video series called All Hands on LinkedIn. Just search for the new warehouse on LinkedIn and follow along.